This is a free sample of the book, Never Ghosted Again, The Art of Being Irresistible, by Cairo Copeland. The first half of this book is posted right here on YouTube, free for everyone to listen to. If you like this content and want to hear or read the rest, or want to listen to it free of ads, visit reinventideal.com slash ghosted. The book is available on Kindle, paperback, and audible at reinventideal.com slash ghosted. Chapter 12 Life of the Party Responsibility for His Own Fun There are two men at the dance hall. One of them is at first a wallflower, standing on the sidelines, looking at all the beautiful women he'd love to dance with, but he's afraid to ask. Until he sees other random men ask these women to dance and they agree, he decides to follow suit after he gets a little liquid courage in him. He proceeds to ask the ones he likes for a dance, starting with the ones he's least attracted to, hoping to slowly build his confidence up as he progresses to a new level with each try. But this method does not help as he's rejected by every one of them. He goes home, without a dance, meeting no one, only to continue drowning in liquor alone. But the other man has a different response. He didn't stand around and wait to make his move. He asked the woman he was attracted to the most for a dance right away, and he was still rejected, but didn't let that stop him. And after he was turned down by all of them, he went right to the dance floor and busted out his best moves all by himself. He may not even know how to dance, probably even made a fool out of himself, but doesn't show a shred of self-consciousness and is not phased one bit by the onlooker's laughter. He's having a good time all by himself. This man may also stand before the toughest crowd to tell the corniest dad joke. The reaction from the listeners is dead silence, perhaps even a cricket, but his reaction is not a storm of sweat excreting from his forehead or looking away to shield himself from embarrassment. But without the slightest stutter in his speech, he replies, Well, I thought it was funny. I don't know what's wrong with you people. He's not afraid to have fun around others in a way that only he may enjoy, because his enjoyment of it is not dependent on others' approval of it. Nor does he give a shit what others' opinions are of him. The only opinion that matters to him is his opinion of himself. He can approach the most attractive woman randomly in public, amongst crowds, and spend 15 minutes talking to her while she neglects to respond with anything other than indifference, a situation you can expect to happen to you. He stays in the interaction, having fun throughout in a way he enjoys, until either she opens or he just gets bored with her and leaves without the stench of defeat. You must take responsibility for your own fun. You cannot allow your mood to depend on how others react to you. You must find what you truly enjoy doing, shamelessly do it, and never allow others to explicitly nor implicitly convince you that you shouldn't enjoy it. It's your life to enjoy, and do so how you please. Without doing anything illegal, of course. Most of the time, a guy is afraid to have fun in his own way. He's self-conscious, especially on the dance floor, because he's worried about what everyone else watching is thinking of him. But here's the kicker. Everyone else is worried about what others are thinking of them just as much. Knowing this can give you a superpower. When you're afraid to talk to someone, speak up for yourself, or start dancing, other people probably want to do the same but are afraid to be the first one. Everyone else feels awkward, self-conscious, shy, and out of place. The goal is to be the ray of light that can snap them out of these feelings, to inspire the feeling in them that it's okay to be themselves. They're wonderful just as they are. And best of all, everyone is too busy worrying about themselves to be judging you. Taking responsibility for starting the fun, initiating the first move, and kickstarting the social gathering is a trait that women find irresistible. Women report being frustrated by guys not making moves. They think to themselves, why isn't he doing anything when he could be? Her mindset does not include the option of doing anything herself. Sure, guys normally would feel more comfortable if women made the moves, but in truth, women feel more comfortable if he made all the moves. You can never expect women to lead. That's your role. You need to be taking charge, making decisions, giving directions, having a plan, always. She may not like the decisions you make, and she doesn't have to. She will like you for making the decisions. However, you want to be in control without being controlling. Avoid being too rigid. Avoid getting involved in decisions that do not affect you. Distinguish joy from pleasure. 
To be able to create your own fun and ultimately be responsible for it, it's important to differentiate joy from pleasure. It's impossible to have any sort of fun while going through an unpleasant experience, like being flaked on, or your date turned out to be not as into you as you thought she should be. In this case, you were seeking pleasure, which comes from external sources. On the other hand, joy is created internally. Joy is self-generated. You can live life alone, autonomously, and still be happy because your inner joy is something no one can take from you. It is not dependent on other people's actions. It is self-sustaining. Sources of joy can be as simple as realizing what things you find funny, what jokes do the trick for you, and coming up with such jokes all on your own. Joy can come from mere thought, like Jonah has when he works on his horror novels while in the state of flow, and the good ideas just populate his head all on their own. Joy can even come from a simple action one can do all on their own, like dancing to their favorite song, even if it is only playing inside their head. And don't forget from earlier, gratitude is one practice that can start increasing happiness right away. Pleasure, on the other hand, requires something from the external world. There isn't anything inherently wrong with seeking pleasure. It is by no means a bad thing, but it needs to be recognized for what it is and where it is coming from. Today's world is all about selling you pleasure on every corner and hoping you'll believe that this next pleasure product will provide you with lasting joy. Confusing the two can be deadly to the mind. The pleasure products put up for sale are quite addictive. Things like video games and Netflix binges. Both the games and the shows have had the input of neurological engineers to keep you hooked on them. It is in the producer's interests to keep you hooked and never satisfied. Otherwise, you'd stop playing, stop watching, and stop consuming. These things are not bad by themselves. It is only the dosage that makes them deadly. Far more addictive and deadly things are being sold to you. One is explicitly public, and the other is kept completely private. They are social media and pornography. While most guys would not easily admit it, most of them have had long porn viewing binge days where hours were dedicated to just viewing one video after another. While watching porn is becoming more acceptable in today's world, it's still something that they like to keep a secret for fear that it denotes inadequacy or inability to get real sex. So they watch simulated sex. Quite often, the fake sex they watch is better than the real sex they've had. That's because the whole reason porn exists is because real women are not like that. Porn is a representation of what one guy, the director, wishes sex was like. But another reason porn exists and why it has such great power over you is because you are culturally conditioned to believe that wanting sex is not normal. You are made to feel shame for wanting it. Now, you have the chance to experience as much of it as you want in private. Who could resist? What makes it so addictive is not because the women in it are beautiful or that the acts are particularly arousing, although both of those statements are quite true. What makes it addictive is how it hijacks the mind from feeling any sort of pain, particularly emotional pain. The stimulation it receives from visual to audible to even the physical feelings while jerking off overrides the mind's ability to feel anything else. It really is the perfect drug. The author is not here to say that this is evil or to push some puritanical agenda, but what needs to be said about these addictive pleasures is that they are taking from you a precious resource and giving little to nothing back. That resource is your time, which is limited. These pleasures may make you happy for a while, but not in a way that lasts. Only really living life can do that, and unrestricted indulgence in these pleasures are not living. Instead, it is waiting to die. Seek out true joy first, then pleasures can be attained. Pleasure-seeking denotes a need for it. More importantly, it denotes neediness. On that note, one particular poison needs to be addressed, and it is for sure a poison far from pleasure. Social media. Quit social media. This poison works in a truly terrifying way. It seems benign at first. What could be wrong with keeping in touch with old friends from high school and college while seeing what foods they're eating? After reading this chapter, you'll never want to use social media again. And if you went through your teenage years before it was popular, you will certainly be grateful for that. You may have noticed that the author does not include any social media links to himself throughout this book, nor in the back of it. There is good reason for this. Certainly defenders of the product will cite certain things it is essential for. It gives us the ability to run a Facebook group for a local organization we belong to, or are the leader of. The hashtag keeps you updated with the latest movements you support. 
It can even inform you of what events are occurring in your city. But how much time do you really spend using it for these purposes? Very little. These companies don't become multi-billion dollar giants if this is all it was used for. The products are specifically engineered to exploit psychological weakness and ensnare you into compulsive usage. Take it from a former Google employee and whistleblower, Tristan Harris. He reveals that a lot of the apps are engineered like a slot machine to make you keep checking it. For example, the like button. This little gizmo was added to create more intermittent reinforcement into Facebook's scrolling and browsing. It has caused people to increase the number of times they check their accounts and profiles. Herein lies the true danger of the device. It heightens your anticipation of something happening. A something that is dependent on others acting instead of taking action to make something happen yourself. The University of Pittsburgh found that the more social media you use, the greater your anxiety. And it's not about the amount of use of it, but rather the fact that it is social judgment in public. A quantitative count of other people's approval. Once that approval is awarded, new reward pathways in the brain are fired up, creating a good feeling. But if those reward pathways are not fired up again, it's like taking drugs away from an addict. And the social media companies purposefully do this. You may have noticed some posts getting more likes than others. That's because they control who and how often your friends see what you post. The point of this control is to make you post more and constantly spend more time on the platform. You have one successful post. The next one is not as successful. So you wonder, am I still relevant to my friends? Do I still matter? This conditioning is toxic to the mind. The effects of this and the following reasons not to use social media are absolutely deadly to your aspiration to be irresistible. A. It encourages superficial friendships. Among all of your Facebook friends, how many of them do you find yourself having a deep, meaningful relationship with? Many of the interactions from a like to a comment are shallow and carry no weight in the long run of things. It gives a false idea that you know these people because you've seen them in pictures and their posts are supposedly their unfiltered thoughts. But what's forgotten is that it is all careful curation of their lives on display. There's more to them behind the scenes that you're not seeing. Career struggles and marital problems. Your superficial online friendship does not much prepare you to comfort them in such things. B. It can make you more negative. It has become the place now where people let out uncensored rants of their frustrations with life and the world. The news feed has become a show of outrage broadcasters particularly when it comes to politics and religion. While such topics are not necessarily to be completely avoided throughout all life, seeing these ugly sides of it frequently as the average Facebook user does has great power in cultivating negativity. More on this in a bit. C. It kills your ability to live in the moment. Pursuing women and becoming irresistible to them will require a unique ability to yield to the moment. Social media encourages you to capture the moment. How many times have you seen people at concerts or games hold up their phones in an attempt to capture it so it can be shared on Facebook? Instead of enjoying the show, they've become more like reporters on duty. And this bleeds over into every aspect of living. Even a meal must have a picture snapped for later posting in a vain attempt to win approval. How can you be responsible for your own fun when you're being taken out of the moment in which you are having it? The irresistible man needs no such approval and can live in the moment. D. It wastes an enormous amount of time. The average person is spending two hours a day on social media. What are they getting from it? A few laughs from a meme? A glance at a sexy picture? This is the any benefit mentality, where even the slightest benefit justifies disproportionate effort. Any business using this mentality is destined to fail. This extra two hours back in your life can be spent working on your purpose, getting a good workout in, or learning to dance, which is a vital skill in this pursuit. Further, the constant scrolling to the next interesting thing, the short messaging and status updates inspire, inspire an immense drop in your attention span. This will hinder your ability to focus in other areas of your life, such as your purpose. E. It gives potential girls a reason not to date you. We put a lot of information about ourselves on social media, the things we love from movies to music, and we let a lot of our unfiltered thoughts out in the status update. The girls you meet and later add on your social media profiles will stalk your profile. It may seem favorable at first that someone is now paying attention to you, but they will always find something about you that they don't like. 
More importantly, it kills the fascination created by mystery. They have an unlimited amount of options. They only need one small reason to drop you from that list of options. Also remember, she falls in love with you in her head before she does in real life. If she has no choice but to wonder about you because there's no information on Facebook about you, she spends more time thinking about you. F. It will remind you of your failures. Are you friends with an ex on social media? What goes through your head when you see her post a picture of herself with her new boyfriend? Be honest. Sure, you may say, I'm happy for her, but deep down, you're upset, because you're being reminded now of a past failure. It doesn't matter if he appears to be better looking than you, or if he appears to be less of a man than you. Either way, it will have a tragic effect on how you value yourself. G. It reinforces the wrong mentality with women. Suppose you do now have a beautiful girlfriend. You're ready to show her off to the world and post pictures of the two of you together. This reignites the behavior of an inferior man who wants to be with a woman more so to be seen with her than to actually be with her. This need for approval bleeds over into other areas of life and creates an overall neediness that will eventually turn her off. Are you using social media, or is it using you? Lastly, social media is a terrible place to meet women. Throw out any ideas in your head about messaging a girl on there in hopes of becoming her boyfriend. The reality of a beautiful woman is that this happens to her ten times a day. It's like having ten scam-likely robocalls ringing your phone all day. Every unattractive, desperate man is already doing this to her. They send her a message that says, Hi, I saw you in my suggested friends list and had to say that you're beautiful. We should hang out sometime. Any inferior man can do that. But the irresistible man has no time for it. Not only is it a waste of time, but the effects it will have on your self-worth are detrimental. Because just as it's easy for any man to make an approach online, it's way easier for her to reject him. Some may even choose to use harsh rejections and post a screenshot of your conversation on her friend's feed to mock you. Can your self-esteem take that kind of hit? It screams out to her, Look at me! I'm desperate! I can't make anything happen for me in the real world, so I'm turning to Facebook like a loser in hopes of a Hail Mary. You'd do best to stay off social media entirely. The girls on there that are posting sexy pictures that cause you to want to message them are doing this specifically because they thrive on the validation. It's a drug for them. They have no concern for you or your feelings. You're not even a human being to them for all they care. You're just a faceless program spitting attention at their command. Further interaction with, and in some cases even observation of these girls, will poison your thoughts about all women in general. And when girls you want to date change their relationship status on there to being in one, it will only make you feel worse. Consider it the worst place to try to meet women. Twice as bad as online dating. The right places to meet women. Learn to dance. While social media is the worst place to try to meet them, let's turn our focus to the right place. The answer to the question, where is the best place to meet women, is the place where you have the most fun. You want to show her that you're a fun person to be around, and can take responsibility for having it all on your own. Now that answer sounds like a cop-out, so for a real one, best place to meet women is on the dance floor. This sounds incredibly disappointing and intimidating. A world you'd prefer is one in which you could just be yourself. Nerding out at the comic book shop, or being a rowdy fan at the game, during which women would just flock to you. But that's just not the world as it is. For many guys, dance clubs and ballrooms are very intimidating. There's a fear of looking stupid. Perhaps you've even been told you have two left feet. Or the high school dance brings back bad memories of the loser's wall. Or a better looking guy cutting in and taking her away from you. Dance clubs are particularly not enjoyable to the introvert. The loud music makes conversation impossible. Your eardrums feel like they're about to explode. There's lots of bumping and immense claustrophobia. Worse yet, this environment is the domain of the drunken douchebag looking for a fight. His bloodthirst has a sensory perception for the weak, especially if he catches them with a hot girl. Ask yourself not where do you meet women or where are there the most women, because the answer to that is the ladies' room. Good luck doing pickup in there. The best question is to ask, where are women going to look for someone like me? Where do women want to meet me? The dance floor.
You take tremendous risk attempting to dance. If you do it badly, it signals to women that you are a bad partner to mate with. So says science. On a subconscious level, it is telling her that your testosterone is below average and cannot muster up enough to give her babies. This is particularly true of the dancing dad that no one finds attractive, but rather laughs at and to a certain extent feels sorry for. Attraction cannot exist side by side with these feelings. But the irresistible man can dance and dance well. Women find it unbelievably attractive. Not so much because you know what you're doing, but rather because it shows you're a fun-loving person that can navigate through challenges. You can literally think on your feet. When we look at life, a metaphor used for it is that it is often a dance. That's because life is a game of no rules that you're expected to win, but not told how. There's some anonymous authority dishing out dictations you must adapt to. The music, if you will. Can you adapt and do so smoothly? Helen Fisher, PhD and anthropologist at Rutgers University, explains, What's really going on is that dancing indicates someone who's social and self-confident. It truly dates back to the time when you were in high school, rising above your awkwardness and handling the attention-driven pressure at the school dance. Notice how girls care far more about those events than do the guys. It is how they test the mettle of their guys at that age. Can he put himself out there, vulnerable to judgment and mockery, and perform when called to? To be far more attractive, not only can you dance, but bravely walk up to her and ask her for one. The rest of the guys, too shy to ask for what they want, will hang around like hungry vultures or circling sharks. The level of creepiness causes discomfort in what was meant to be an otherwise fun environment. But one brave enough to ask for her hand in a dance saves her from such discomfort. It can almost be said that once you've made this move, you've already won. Then during the dance, if he can continue to prove himself, she can't help but give in to his charm. To be able to bust the moves, Skill is required, and showing that you took the time to learn something shows you have a high degree of self-discipline. It's even a bonus that it's something she can relate to. Subconsciously, it tells her that this man is someone that's presentable. He can conduct himself in a non-verbal way and knows all the right moves to make. It is no secret that women love attention. They thoroughly enjoy the moment in which they get to show off to others. When everyone else in the room notices them, their day is made. You, as the one leading the dance, get to give her that moment, and she will be grateful for that. Now, her time to shine has come. A fantasy many of them have is to be discovered by some chance opportunity. Like a music producer heard her sing at karaoke and talked to her about a record deal afterwards. Then there's also the fact that she's likely been watching the women she admires most dance, took notes of the moves, and learned them herself. You just gave her the venue to put those efforts to use. Her heart is beating hard for multiple reasons. She's moving to the music, being the center of attention, and finally getting real close with a stranger. This elevated heart rate works in your favor. It forces her to associate excitement and the positive energy with you. The fact that you get to get up all close and in her space is icing on the cake for you. But it also allows her to get used to you being that close that soon. You may think that dancing is not cool or not masculine. It's the leisure of sissies. The boys famous for dancing are the boy bands you couldn't stand. But none of that should matter because dancing is manly to her. It's a smooth type of manliness that she appreciates, more so than other masculine abilities like lifting heavy weights. It's manly to her because you're the one that must lead. You're in charge. You get the ability to show her that you're competent, confident, assertive, athletic, and can handle risk. Here you have it. The opportunity to appear attractive without saying a word. Far too often, guys are afraid of talking to girls because they don't know what to say. But this activity will show that you can coordinate both your mind and your body, as they must work together to do this well. It transcends the small talk and shallow conversation that many approaches start with. A new connection is formed, and a deeper one, because this shows her you can think and can also make the appropriate next move. The Art of Flirting Without Flirting Expressing Yourself Without Uttering a Word and once you've become good at the art of flirting without flirting, actual flirting becomes so effortless. No longer are you perceived as creepy when you attempt it. You've already broken into this territory. There's no barrier to cross, no safe testing to try. Therefore, it is highly recommended you learn to dance. 
Without this skill, you're leaving a very powerful tool in the chest and very beautiful women on the table. Another benefit is that the dancing community is one where it is easy to make deeper friendships. These are friends that never bore each other because they always have something to do. These are friends that travel to exotic locations together without much stressful planning needed. And these are friends that always have each other's backs. How short is your life? It is imperative that you start taking charge of your own fun. Do not put it off. It is far too tempting, particularly for the purpose-driven men, to delay the time they will actively pursue fun. And the fun that's being described here is not pleasure, but the type that generates inner joy. The better days never come. Your best days are not ahead of you. Your best day is today. You must remember that life is too short to piss away. How short is it? Suppose you do manage to live to age 90. That's only 32,850 days. Are you making each one of them count? Even worse, if you're 30 years old, you have only 21,000 days left. Do you want to waste a single one of those days scrolling through a social media app that's making you miserable? Do you want to waste it looking at porn or playing a video game that's only good in the moment? Do you want to waste it pursuing that one girl? Money comes and goes. Women come and go. Pleasure comes and goes. Time goes and is gone forever. Those other things are not scarce, but your time is. When making decisions, factor into them not just the money, effort, and emotions that need to be spent. Give the highest weight to the amount of time that they will take. On that note, when things are not going the way you want them to, just leave. You have no obligation to make sure others are having fun if you're not. Remember the story of Jonah and Christina and their beach day. The right move that Jonah should have made was to just walk away. He should have just said, You know what, Christina? It was nice to meet you, but this isn't what I had planned for today. I've got other things to do, so I think I'll tend to them. Have a good day. When you're on a date and it's starting to go bad, like a conversation at dinner that reveals things about your date that you just can't stand, walk away. Put the money for the meal down on the table, thank her for her time, and then leave. When you show up for a date and the girl is not what her pictures promised her to appear as, walk away. It shows you're a valuable person whose time matters. There is nothing wrong with it or rude about it. What's rude is for someone to waste your time or for you to waste their time if you really are no longer interested in them. Life is too short. 32,850 days. The irresistible man knows this. Thank you for listening to this free sample of the book, Never Ghosted Again, The Art of Being Irresistible, by Cairo Copeland. If you enjoyed it and want to hear or read the rest, or want to listen to it free of ads, visit reinventideal.com slash ghosted. The book is available on Kindle, paperback, and Audible at reinventideal.com slash ghosted.